morning everyone this is pastor dave grace and peace to you in the name of our lord jesus christ i'm continuing to provide this service for you for the folks who can't get out but are watching on uh, on facebook and so that you can uh, at least hear a message even though you can't make it to church and some of you i am sure don't feel safe yet coming back to church and I certainly understand that but uh, this morning I'll be giving a the same message to our folks uh, at the church and we're hopeful for a good outcome there but uh, anyway we'll get started here and I, I just want to share uh, a couple of passages of scripture with you the first one is from uh, Genesis chapter 22 verses 1 through 14 you may have heard this story before uh, at a time when Abraham was tested and tested greatly sometime later God tested Abraham Abraham he said to him Abraham here I am he replied then God said take your son your only son whom you love Isaac and go to the region of Moriah sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on a mountain I will show you early in the next morning Abraham got up and loaded his donkey he took with him two of his servants and his son Isaac when he had cut enough wood for the burnt offering he set out for the place God had told him about on the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. He said to his servants, Stay here with the donkey, while I and the boy go over there. We will worship, and then we will come back to you. Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and placed it on his son Isaac, and he carried, himself carried the fire and the knife. As the two of them went on together, Isaac spoke up and said to his father Abraham, Father? Yes, my son, Abraham replied. The fire and the wood are here, Isaac said. But where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham answered, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. And the two of them went on together. When they reached the place God had told him about, Abraham built an altar there and arranged the wood on it. He bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar, on top of the wood. Then he reached out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called out to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Do not lay a hand on the boy, he said. Do not do anything to him. Now I know that you fear God, because you have not withheld from me your son, your only son. Abraham picked up, looked up, and there in the thicket he saw a ram caught by its horns. He went over and took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called that place, the Lord will provide. And to this day, it is said, on the mountain of the Lord, it will be provided. And I'm going to refer back to that passage here in a little bit as, uh, as I give my message. The other passage is from uh, Romans, chapter 6, verses 12 through 23. Therefore do not let sin reign in your mortal body, so that you obey its evil desires. Do not offer any part of yourself to sin as an instrument of wickedness, but rather offer yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and offer every part of yourself to him 
as an instrument of righteousness. For sin shall no longer be your master, because you are not under the law, but under grace. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law, but under grace? By no means. Don't you know that when you offer yourselves to someone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one you obey, whether you are slaves to sin, which leads to death, or to obedience, which leads to righteousness. But thanks be to God that though you used to be slaves to sin, you have come to obey from your heart the pattern of teaching that has now claimed your allegiance. You have been set free from sin and have become slaves to righteousness. I am using an example from everyday life because of your human limitations. Just as you used to offer yourselves as slaves to impurity and to ever-increasing wickedness, so now offer yourselves as slaves to righteousness leading to holiness. When you were slaves to sin, you were free from the control of righteousness. What benefit did you reap at that time from the things you are, not, you are now ashamed of? Those things result in death. But now you have been set free from sin and have become slaves of God. The benefit you reap leads to holiness and the result is eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. May God add his blessing to these readings from Genesis and from Romans. Well, my message this morning is on giving and receiving. It is better to give than to receive. We all know that. But there are times when if we receive something with gratitude, receiving can be very honor, honorable as well. There is a satisfaction in giving because when it comes to giving, when, the, when it comes to giving up some of our time and, and talents to help anyone who is in need, it obviously can make us feel good inside. Now as believers, I know for sure that there are many of us, many of us here who have done exactly that. And there may not be a day that goes by when we do not do something to help someone. Even if it is just in the form of an encourage, encouraging word through a phone call or a message of, of some type. But when you think about it, this is really what a believer in Christ is all about. These are the actions we take. We are thinking out of the box, so to speak. And it's really what the church is all about. If we've ever felt that the church is not so much a building, but people, right during, now during this pandemic, that has made, this has been made remarkably clear. And sometimes we've had to jump through some hoops in order to make that happen because of the restrictions. But we try to not let that discourage us. We serve and, and we love God, and so much of that is through serving and loving people. But what about receiving? Receiving has sometimes gotten got a bad rap let me say that it's okay to receive and to receive graciously because when we do that, good things can happen. When we receive something, 
a lot of times even without asking. And we do not want to be too, too prideful to say, no, I don't, I don't want this, or I don't need this. But Jesus, in this short passage of Scripture that I will read to you, was affirming the positive aspects of both giving and receiving. So I read to you from uh, Matthew chapter 10 verses 40 through 42. Anyone who welcomes you welcomes me, and anyone who welcomes me welcomes the one who sent me. Whoever becomes a prophet as a, as a prophet will receive a prophet's reward. And whoever welcomes a righteous person as a righteous person will receive a righteous person's reward. And if anyone gives even a cup of cold water to one of these little ones who is my disciple, truly I tell you, that person will certainly not lose their reward. May God bless his this reading from the Gospel of Matthew. Let's take a moment to pray. Dear God, we thank you uh, this morning that your word is so meaningful to us. Help us to make sure that the full meaning and purpose is right there, right there within our hearts, and so that we can use it in our life. And so now may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Well, right here is where we see for ourselves the benefits of keeping good company. But wait a minute, you say, didn't Jesus hang out with sinners? Well, we know that we are all sinners. I suppose that in defining sinners in this case, you could say that he hung out with the ones who engaged in activities that you and I might not might not be so prone to do if we identify ourselves as Christians. You know, like drunkenness uh, or those with hardly any moral values, those who are not exactly kosher in their business dealings, uh, the tax collectors of the day, and people like that. Yet, how else was he going to, to be able to, to get them to try and follow him if he just totally put them out of reach? I mean, he didn't have to engage in all of the same activities that they did, but he had to be, he had to be part of their community. And, and could not isolate himself any more than you and I would try to isolate ourselves from the rest of the world. But if we are listening to the voice or the advice of people who seek to promote goodness, or if we receive that advice and take it to heart, we let it sink in to our own conscience and we have nothing to lose and everything to gain. It follows along the same lines as when we listen to Jesus. We take in his teachings and let them be a part of, a, a part of us. Then we have the greatest benefit there is being a recipient of of his grace, love, mercy, and forgiveness. Not only have we received the greatest gift possible, but now we are able to turn that around and give of ourselves in a way that prior to this we have we may have thought unimaginable. 
See, once we have received Christ, our priorities start to change. Everything is not all about me. We ask ourselves, what are our plans? What are our plans for the day or for the week or longer than that? Our thinking starts to change in other ways. As the Apostle Paul stated in our scripture passage from Romans, he says we are no longer slaves to sin. We are not so inclined to be self-seeking, not so inclined to be self-indulgent, not so in want of being constantly entertained. Our relationships can change as well. We do not have we don't do not feel the need to to put down other people just because they are not like you and I. We do not feel the need to issue forth vile or or hateful comments. We do not feel like we have to go around with a chip on our shoulder. Did you ever notice that a smile can change the atmosphere of a whole room? Or even just during a one-on-one -on -one encounter? I believe that in our associations with other people, wherever we are, having a more joyful mood, at least a smile in your eyes, can change things. I, I've seen it happen. Sure, there are a few who are a stubborn and hard-hearted and would choose not to exchange a smile in return. But there are more who, are, who respond to that kind of a thing. Overall, we seek to do good. It kind of goes back to the message that I gave here at the church early on, almost a year ago. Wesley's three simple rules. Do no harm. Do good. And stay in love with God. It really helps to simplify our life. And it is so very much grounded in biblical principles. Now here's a story of a man who was given much by God. He received many things. And because he was such a grateful recipient, he acknowledged and obeyed when God asked him to do something. We're talking about Abraham in our scripture reading from Genesis. And he was, in fact, willing to give and to give much. At one point, he was asked to give his son, to actually sacrifice his son. Then, seemingly at the last minute, he was spared of the need to go through with this. He was provided with a substitute sacrifice, this ram that was, that was caught in the thicket by its horns. The ram would be used as a burnt offering instead. That is a story that is very challenging to us when we try to understand it. Why would God ask Abraham to do something like this in the first place? Is this the kind of a God that we are dealing with? A God who asks us to do such a, a cruel act to a member of our own family? I think that it would be unfair to look at this story as it stands alone. If you read it in a larger context, mainly looking at the events that occurred in several chapters before Genesis chapter 22, you'll discover that God has promised Abraham 
that he would be the father of many nations, and that his son born to him, Isaac, would be, which was a miracle in itself, because of the old age of Abraham and Sarah, that he, Isaac, would be the one to carry on after him. So surely Abraham had, at least in the back of his mind, some idea that Isaac would be spared. That even though he was asked to do this as a, as a test of faith, it wouldn't turn out nearly as bad as anyone might perceive that it could have. Just think if, it w if that would have happened. That would have changed the, the, the course of history. Isaac would, would not be a part of it to carry it, on, to carry it on. That's for sure. And our, our idea of who God is, that would be quite different as well. But we do know who God is and how he is such a just and fair God who simply wants the best for us. <coughs> me. But God is the one who gives, who provides. Abraham received. He accepted his rewards gracious, graciously. And he didn't let doubts cloud his mind, cloud his thinking. And in the end, he was rewarded in a very profound way. He was the father of many nations. I wish I had that much faith to know that even when I'm asked to, to go the extra mile for someone, that there's a reason for it. As Abraham received this promise as he was provided for, then he gave back. He gave back time and time again. I guess if I really think about it, I have been provided for. Even at times when I thought there was not much hope. Somehow the Lord comes through and provides in, in ways that I do not always expect. Somehow the Lord takes what I have, and I can be thankful for that. He does. And, and then I look back and say that the next time I start to doubt, I might have to step back and look at how he has been, how he has been working in my life up to this point, and that there is no reason that he is not going to stop working. See, we are all recipients of God's infinite grace. That is a great gift to receive, time and time again. Now with that, we are now ready to give in return. We are ready to give of ourselves without expecting anything in return. But it's funny, though, that even if it doesn't cross our mind that we should expect anything in return, there is some way, somehow, that we are rewarded. But yes, by, by all means, give, knowing that loving without limit, that is in God's plan for you and I. We don't have to be bogged down with the chaos that is in the world. We can look for, for some ways to try and solve it, to lessen it, but we don't have to be part of any crowd that, that hates and divides people. We are free people. We are free to, to live in such a way that 
that we can face each day with, with confidence and confidence in a God who is is working in and through us. He's working out a beautiful plan for our life. Even when we feel the cards seem to be stacked against us, we know that we can defy the odds and get through any any challenges and trials and temptations that come our way. Praise God for how He is working in our life and in the life of the church. Let's pray. Dear God, we thank you that you are working in our life and we ask that we be those grateful recipients of your love, of your spirit, and we just ask for the ability to sustain and walk daily with you, always growing closer to you. It is in your name we pray. Amen. So yes, I, I want to continue to provide this uh, service for you people, on, uh, especially on Facebook, who uh, can't get out yet uh, to, to see this service here at Knoxville. And uh, I invite all of you to come uh, when you can, when you feel safe to do so. Uh, we are prayerful and hopeful this, that this will, uh, con this will continue to make progress as we work through these different phases that we're experiencing here in the uh, state of Illinois. And uh, we look forward to a future where we can uh, uh, continue to get back to normal, the new normal, where we are going to be a uh, church and a community that is uh, has a experiencing a revival in our faith. That is our prayer. And so now, folks, may the Holy Spirit, which gives us much and allows us to receive graciously, always dwell, dwell within. I will see you all later, and God bless.